it's obviously a, a personal thing and you're, you're quite proud of that, but, but I'm, I'm also proud of the body of work me and others have done on this topic. I mean, when I started this research on poverty, I mean, it really wasn't taken very seriously in economics. Um, it's taken a lot to get economists to think seriously about problems of poverty and inequality, and there's a lot more to do, right? So I also see this uh, awards like this as a recognition of the status that concerns, serious concerns, scholarly concerns amongst economists on the issues of poverty and inequality, the status those concerns have, have, have attained uh, in the profession, and that's good. We're seeing in the developing world, we're seeing enormous progress against extreme absolute poverty. Uh, and that's, um, that's great news. Uh, we're talking about hundreds of millions of people who have escaped uh, the worst form of poverty in the last 30, 30 years or more. Um, so we're very happy about that and we should be. It's a great achievement. Uh, it's been driven largely by higher rates of economic growth in low-income countries and now middle-income countries, um, but also increasingly by better social policies, investments in health and education, which have, been, which have been very important. So we're seeing a lot of success. We're also seeing some reasons for concern. Um, absolute poverty is falling, but relative poverty is not. We're seeing rising numbers of, in fact, rising numbers of people who are no longer poor by a, um, a common international standard, like the World Bank's $1.90 a day poverty line, but are poor by the standards of the country they live in. We're also seeing less progress than we'd like to see in, in reaching the very poorest. So we're getting, developing countries are getting better at, at reducing the numbers of people living at very low levels of living, but the very poorest are staying at roughly the same level of living over time. Some countries doing better than others, but as a general proposition, the, the improvements we're seeing at the very bottom are, are, are very modest. And that's an important difference between the developing world and today's rich world when it was poor. The rich world, countries like Switzerland, made, I think, more progress. We're not sure about this, but I think they made more progress in, in reaching the very poorest through social policy. So the big challenge going forward for the developing world is how to make more effective social policies. People think it's increasing, but that's not right. Now, I emphasize that's the way it's normally measured. There's an interesting tension between two very different narratives about global inequality. Your, your assumption that it's increasing, many people hold that view. Uh, economists, when they look at the data, have decided that it's decreasing. The reason they think we think it's decreasing is the growth in low-income countries. So precisely what I said before, low-income countries seeing higher rates of growth, that's bringing up the bottom of the global distribution. So that's reducing global inequality. What's increasing is inequality within many rich countries and also within many but not all developing countries. So within country inequality is kind of creeping upwards on average uh, and within some countries, like the country I live in, the United States, inequality is increasing quite sharply. Right? in some countries in Western Europe, but not all. You know, countries like France, for example, uh, may have been better able to keep down inequality. Other countries, Britain, for example, we're seeing rising inequality. So very different experiences. Looking at the global picture, the world as a whole, relative inequality is falling. I mean, making markets work better for poor people is a hugely important step. Uh, at present, we talk about a lot of pro-market reform in, in developing countries, but the reforms are not helping enough the poorest people. We make reforms that make markets work better for relatively well-off people, but not poor people. That means making credit markets work better, land markets, labour markets, um, better information, um, better access to opportunities in those markets, um, all of this is buttressed by better education and health policies, which has a lot to do with better services. Um, we've made a lot of progress in getting kids in school, but the quality of their education is, is not improving is nearly enough, right? particularly in poor countries. Um, on social policy, we've made some improvements. We've seen better efforts at reaching poorer people with social policy, but much more to do, much more to do. Um, a lot of the efforts that countries have made in very fine targeting, for example, trying to 
um, design policies that um, as far as possible exclude the non-poor and include the poor. Uh, those efforts have had a mixed record. Um, I've often thought that and, and advised some countries that try to relax about targeting. The objective is, is poverty reduction, not targeting per se. Targeting is a, can be a dangerous concept. Sometimes it's really useful, other times you end up imposing costs on governments and poor people in order to better reach uh, your objectives. And those costs need to be fully considered. I think it is true. I think globalization, understood broadly, has helped reduce poverty mainly by helping getting low-income countries better access to global markets through, through, through exporting goods, which employs people in those countries. Um, this created tensions, as we know, across the world. In some uh, rich countries, it's believed that globalization has hurt uh, many workers. Um, that's actually questionable. Um, it's not clear. The evidence is really not compelling. I actually think that globalization is, in a way, it's, it's given too much credit and it's also blamed for too much. You know, it's not, uh, it's not as, as important a factor. It has contributed, I believe, to poverty reduction globally, but it's not quite as important as people make out. I think other things, the importance of basic health and education policies, the importance of making markets work better for poor people, even in a non-globalizing world, these things help enormously. Agrarian reform, making sure that uh, poor people have the access and the titles to the land they farm, that they have access to the inputs they need. A lot of policies in just agriculture and rural development can help enormously in poverty reduction, even if those, the agricultural products are not sold globally, they're sold domestically. Um, so it's a many, much more complicated thing. The other thing that we've learned is there's no sort of magic bullet here. Right? I, for 40 years studying poverty and how to fight it, I keep hoping I will find this magic bullet. And it's, it's just not, I think it's not there, right? And the reason is that the differences in country circumstances are so important. In one, we have to find what in each particular country is holding back poor people. And sometimes it'll be a generic issue. I've mentioned issues like credit market failure. Credit market failure is a common problem. But there are many specific things about a country. Particular governance failures, particular natural resource problems, um, particular institutional issues in a country which need to be discovered and figured out and, and, and addressed in a very country specific way. So no magic bullets, some general principles, um, some things we should certainly be looking for in, 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 in each country, but also don't keep in mind the heterogeneity, the differences. I think uh, there will be an end to the worst forms of poverty. All right? Extreme poverty in the developing world, living on less than, say, $2 a day. This kind of poverty uh, will, will, will disappear eventually. Um, the first sustainable development goal is to eliminate, for the UN, the first sustainable development goal is to eliminate this form of poverty by 2030. I don't think we're on track to doing that. Um, we're, we're, if you just count the number of poor people, yes, it looks promising, but the bottom is not rising enough. You know, the very lowest level of living has got to rise to that $2 a day, and only then have we eliminated poverty. So I'm, I'm a bit pessimistic on that, but that's just a matter of whether it's in, in within 15 years or, or 30 years. I mean, you know, I think we're getting there. The bigger challenge is in inequality and relative poverty. As I mentioned, what we're seeing is large numbers of people who are kind of just above this international poverty line, but are still poor by the standards of the country they live in, typical standards of the country they live in, bunching up. That also means vulnerability. Uh, a crisis can put, push a lot of people into that extreme form of poverty fairly, very easily. So there's no cause for complacency here. We're, we're on track. How long it will take is, is unclear. Uh, a lot of challenges ahead. But that, the worst forms of poverty can and will be eliminated. Learn your quantitative skills. Right? They're so important. Uh, do as much econometrics as you can. Right? Uh, but don't lose sight of, of, of economics and understanding the theoretical reasons why you investigate an issue, understanding how to best interpret a problem. But the quantitative skills are, are now at a real premium. Um, economists have done a lot here in contributing to um, the efforts in what we call data science, um, for example, there's a broader area, range of issues. 
but the quantitative skills in, in collecting and studying economic data uh, are hugely important. So students should invest in those skills while they can. Yeah, because if poverty disappears, they won't have any jobs. No, there will be, there will be still work to do, because <laughs> inequality is, is rising, as you say, at least in many countries, and that's a real challenge.